Welcome to Beg to Differ, the Bulwark's weekly roundtable discussion featuring civil conversation across the political spectrum from center left to center right. I'm Mona Charon, syndicated columnist and policy editor of The Bulwark. I'm joined by our regulars, Bill Galston of the Brookings Institution and the Wall Street Journal, Linda Chavez of the Niskanen Center, and Damon Linker of The Week. We're delighted to welcome our guest this week, Michael J. Totten. Michael spent more than a decade as a foreign correspondent and foreign policy analyst specializing in the Middle East. And his work has appeared in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, The Atlantic, and many other places. So we are delighted to have him join us, especially because our first topic today is the conspiracy-mindedness, uh, the, the growing conspiratorial mindset in America. Um, just an example, uh, the, if you ask people um, about the vaccine and whether they plan to uh, take the COVID vaccine. Um, Let me see, I have this. Um, 60% say that they would get the vaccine and 21% say they definitely would not and are pretty certain that more information would not change their minds. Um, So I'm gonna start with you, Damon. do you think that people are more conspiracy minded now than in the past in America? You know, there's that famous uh, essay, the paranoid style in American politics. Uh, is this new or not new? Uh, both. Can I say that and therefore yeah. not be wrong? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, clearly there, there, there is a way in which conspiracy theorizing and speculation is in a way coeval with human society, civilization. It waxes and wanes in different times and places. There is a robust tradition of this in this country, uh, as, as Michael Totten could extemporize on, uh, is certainly the Middle East has its history of it as well. Um, The difference today, I think, is that we are all sort of intertwined and connected and information flows freely all over the place instantly. And that, I think, is enabling the conspiracies that would always be floating around to become much more potent and and viral in a way that is, I think, quite dangerous because it, it only takes one or two really good juicy sounding uh, hyper rational explanations for why some confusing thing happens uh, to be someone to share something like that on Twitter or uh, Facebook or Reddit. And, and you can instantly have thousands of people disseminating it in, in the space of a few minutes. And then from there it can snowball and ricochet around the country in an afternoon. That's something human societies have never had at their disposal. I mean, you would have conspiracies, but they would have to, by definition, be spread by, by literal word of mouth on the street, in the village, and they therefore would would end up spreading relatively slowly, relatively limited within uh, time and space. Uh, But now you can have a conspiracy that's launched in, I don't know, I don't want to make it seem as if this is all somehow foreign intelligence ops, although there is some of that as well. But, you know, uh, a a Russian uh, counterintelligence operation could, or an intelligence operation could launch a conspiracy on a website site somewhere and within a few hours it's it's ricocheting around the world like a pinball um and then therefore thousands or even millions or tens of millions of people could be sharing it well by Uh, the way damon can i interrupt you for just one second to observe that um in the 1980s the uh uh, and not and early 90s the the soviets did uh, distribute a conspiracy theory about the origins of the AIDS vaccine that got a lot of pickup in the black community in America and other places, you know, that, that it had been designed on purpose to eliminate black people. Oh yeah. I mean, there, there's that example and many, many others. So they, others, they happen, yeah. they, they happen organically and then they can be the, the our predilection 
toward them uh, can be manipulated by our adversaries and uh, opponents in the world. Uh, but with the technological uh, means of communication that we have today, uh, their potency is, I think, uh, greatly enhanced in a way yeah. that is very, very dangerous. And I think in that respect, unique. Yeah. So, Michael, you lived in the Middle East, reported from the Middle East for a long time. Um, I lived there for a year myself. I lived in Israel for a year and uh, saw that the uh, Arab press was just remarkably rife with all kinds of conspiracy theories. And it was presented on Arab television and so on. You know, these crazy ideas about what the Israelis were up to, what they were capable of. And uh and I, I had the sense, and tell me if this is, I think this is something you've also written about, that, uh, that that kind of thing really can hold back an entire society from, because, because they become crippled by their poor information. Yeah, I agree. And I actually think it's much worse than that. Uh, okay. So let me put it to you this way. Um, yeah, I spent more than a decade on and off reporting from the Middle East. And I lived in Beirut briefly. I went back to Lebanon more times than I can count. I went to Iraq seven times. It was hard to believe, but I did. And I went around some other less dysfunctional places. And so let me break the region down this way. There are countries in the Middle East where a majority of the population believes the same conspiracy theories. There are places with competing conspiracy theories. And there are countries where conspiracy theories aren't terribly prevalent. So the latter group, where conspiracy theories aren't terribly prevalent, at least relative to other countries in the region, include Tunisia and Morocco. The West Bank and Gaza are the best examples of places where a majority believes the same conspiracy theories. And those theories target foreigners, primarily Israelis and secondarily Americans. And Lebanon and Iraq are examples of places with competing conspiracy theories that targets groups of people, primarily Sunni and Shia Muslims, that live in the same country. So countries that aren't awash in conspiracy theories are doing relatively well. I mean, look at Tunisia. It's the one Arab country that had a successful revolution against a dictatorship and has been reasonably well-functioning democracy ever since with repeated peaceful transfers of power from one party to another. And Morocco is a constitutional monarchy with a parliament that wields real, if not supreme power. Both countries are reasonably stable and healthy, and I wouldn't mind living in either one of them for a while. Now, places where a majority believes in the same conspiracy theories, such as the West Bank and Gaza, find themselves at war with the foreign villain at the center of their conspiracy theories. And countries with competing conspiracy theories directed internally find themselves in a state of chronic civil war. So I've seen this up close and in person over and over again. It's shocking and appalling, and I have a visceral reaction against conspiracy theories as a result, because they're all fun and games until they contribute to setting up a war. So Linda, in 2011, um, this question was asked of uh, Democrats. Uh, how likely is it that people in the federal government either assisted in the 9-11 attacks or took no action to stop the attacks because they wanted the United States to go to war in the Middle East? So 22.6% of Democrats said it was very likely, and another 28.2%, so making a majority, called it somewhat likely. Um, so, you know, this is as we were saying before, this is this is not really new, although it may be getting worse. Well, it's not new. And of course, there is a difference. You did not have someone in the Oval Office in 2011, uh, namely Barack Obama, who was promulgating uh, that theory. And the problem right. with the conspiracy theories today, and they really are crazy. Uh, I mean, if you read the filings um, in some of these court cases, if you've watched any of the hearings, so-called hearings, these are usually meetings in a motel someplace uh, with characters who look like they're trying out for Saturday Night Live. Uh, but if you if you listen to them, um, they really are nutty conspiracies without a scintilla of evidence. And yet you now have the president of the United States insisting uh, that they're true, insisting he didn't just win this election. He didn't just squeak through this election. It was a landslide 
Um, I mean, I think he would promote the idea if, if he were given the chance that um, he could beat uh, the percentage of votes that Vladimir Putin gets in, in elections in Russia. So I, I think that's the big difference. And it's important because, yes, there are always going to be people who believe nonsense. I mean, a quarter to a third of Americans and believe that, you know, there are UFOs that, that land and people get abducted. Um, but the difference is that when you have leaders, respectable uh, people at the top of the party who reiterate these things. I wrote a piece in the Bulwark today um, about um, people like Bill Bennett, uh, Roger Kimball, John Eastman, who's now the president's attorney, uh, spouting this nonsense. And that's what's really dangerous because it makes it acceptable. Bill, I'm going to, I'm going to do your work for you. I'm going to say, I think it is far, far worse among Republicans than among Democrats. I'm just putting that out there. I mean, it is, um, as Linda was saying, you know, there are leading intellectuals now uh, who on the right, who peddle this garbage, uh, as well as, of course, the, the occupant of the Oval Office. Um, but, um, but the question, I guess, for you, Bill, as somebody who does, you know, hope that we can make policy based on reason and so forth is, um, you know, how do we begin to break through those barriers and, and get to people who are, you know, look, they're getting a diet from their media that, that, uh, seems reasonable to them, you know, that, uh, uh, there is a deep state conspiracy. I, I know har former Harvard professors who watch Fox news all the time and believe without hesitation that there was a deep state conspiracy against Trump, for example. Well, uh, as we, began to record this podcast, uh, the latest Quinnipiac poll was released, and it found that 77% of Republicans believe that there was widespread voter fraud. Uh, and despite Linda's accurate characterization of all of the lawsuits as presenting not a scintilla of evidence, to support that proposition. Uh, and frankly, I don't think these sentiments will subside quickly. So if progress were dependent on a change in mass public opinion, uh, I would be very pessimistic. I don't think that's the way it's going to happen. I think in this context, it will happen from the top down rather than the bottom up. And that is to say, the way it may be happening in the House and the Senate of the United States right now uh, regarding the COVID-19 emergency relief bill, where you get a bunch of people together across party lines uh, who, are, who are prepared to do business on the basis of a joint assessment of what the situation on the ground is and what an adequate response uh, would look like. Uh, and I think if we're going to get a virtuous circle going, it will be through some combination of presidential leadership intensely focused on proposing areas of potential common ground and then stewarding uh, a bipartisan conversation, plus a critical mass of elected officials in the House and the Senate who are willing to cooperate in that endeavor. Uh, once these conspiracy theories gain a mass following, uh, it is very difficult to dislodge them. And the widespread fraud theory is particularly dangerous because it goes to the public's fundamental belief about the legitimacy of the current occupant of the Oval Office. Or well, and I the, say next the, one, the next the one, the next one. What I yes. mean, what I meant to say was the future yeah. occupant right. of the Oval right. Office. This right, is, This is about this is about Joe Biden. Exactly, and so and, yeah. uh, so look, uh, I have no easy formula. I have no magic wand. 
I do have a hypothesis about how prog- progress is possible in these circumstances. But as I said, it does not begin with the people themselves. Yeah, that's really that that's that's interesting. Um, of course, it will we'll see. I of course I hope you're right, but I have seen certainly on the right that the way to um, to prominence and the way to power has been to denounce any kind of com- of uh, compromise as betrayal and uh, to go, you know, beat the drums about, you know, anyone, you know, John Boehner lost his position as speaker because he was seen as too compromising and so on and so forth. And uh, it's, a, it's an old story. So we will see. Uh, we'll see how that goes. Uh, I want to give a tip of the hat to Jonathan V. Last of The Bulwark, who wrote a piece in October saying, you know, write this down. He said this in in just this way. He said, write this down, the ticket of admission for Republican politics going forward will be the belief that the election of 2020 was illegitimate and that Biden stole it. Uh, So there we are. All right, let's let's talk now about uh, some of the Biden picks. Uh, He's made uh, a few more uh, appointments or proposed appointments. and uh, let's start with you, Michael, about uh, about Lloyd Austin, because he is a retired general um, and uh, he would be the first African-American secretary of defense, but he would require a waiver because he's only been out of the Pentagon for, I think, four years and the law requires a seven year gap. And um, this would be the second time in a row uh, or the second administration in a row where such a waiver was sought. And there are a bunch of democratic senators who said they would never do it. So where does that leave us? Well, I think the critics are not wrong for grumbling about him as secretary of defense because he's retired military and the post is supposed to go to a civilian. And the theory is that the skill set is completely different, that generals, you know, their, their skill set is all, related to war and fighting the enemy. And the Secretary of Defense is basically a politician and generals are not trained to be politicians. Although in truth, once you get high up enough, if you've got four stars on your lapel, you, you pretty much are a politician within the military. Mm-hmm. So I'm not sure if that um, criticism is quite as um, relevant as it may seem on the surface. But it is a reasonable complaint. But that was true for James Mattis. And Mattis was terrific. He was exactly who we needed in 2016. So for me personally, I refuse to get upset about it. I'm just glad that we're going to have competent professionals running the government, really regardless of policy. I mean, like a lot of people, I think maybe everybody on this podcast, I don't fit neatly into anyone's ideological box. Mm -hmm. So I'm never going to be entirely on board with policy from either party. But who cares? I mean, that's democracy. You can only reasonably expect to get what you want 50% of the time anyway, at most. And I don't have the right to expect or demand everything I want from a policy perspective, but I do have the right to expect and demand competence, professionalism, honesty, and integrity. A healthy, well-functioning democracy can have all of those things after every single election cycle, no matter who wins. And with Lloyd Austin, we're going to get those things. So I'm good with it. Hmm. Well, and I guess you could make the argument that while the law says you should have a seven-year gap, it also gave the Senate the opportunity to waive that requirement. So um, so there is that. Um, That's true. And is there anything magical going to happen at the seven-year mark that hasn't already happened at the four-year mark? Right, right, I mean, it's right. kind of arbitrary. They could have said, well, it has to be four years. And everybody would have who thinks seven years was reasonable probably would have thought four years is reasonable. Right. It's Linda, not like are you retired all, yesterday. No, no, exactly. Linda, are you at all worried about the, um, you know, box checking that seems to be going on with, you know, well, we have to have an African-American at defense and we have to have a Hispanic at HHS and that sort of thing? Uh, yes, I am. But maybe for a slightly different reason than you might suspect. I think that the constant harping on race and a national origin uh, by Uh, the uh, Biden campaign by even President-elect Biden himself really makes it look 
like the people that are being chosen who happen to be black or who happen to be Hispanic or Asian or anything else are being chosen primarily because of that. And I really, really dislike it. I see it. You know, I was very annoyed. The Wall Street Journal this week uh, or last week um, had a had an editorial in which they talked about uh, Javier Becerra, uh, who's been nominated to be secretary of HHS. And they, you know, suggested that he was not qualified. Well, I'm sorry, the guy's been in, was a a Congress, uh, served in Congress, I think it was 12 terms, attorney general um, of the state of California. And I was looking back um, at some of the people who have served uh, as a secretary of HHS. I mean, Alex Azar is more qualified. I don't, you know, uh, Tom Price was a congressman. He was more qualified. Yeah. Uh, Sylvia Burwell, Tommy Thompson, Mike, well, the, Tommy Thompson was a governor. Michael Levitt was a governor. Donna Shalala, uh, again, someone who had uh, been a congressperson. So I think the very fact that you put so much emphasis on this makes them look like tokens. And I think that's really unfortunate. You ought to be, you ought to have a very, very uh, large pool of candidates that ought to, in fact, I think, reflect the diversity that is in America, not just racially and ethnically, but other kinds of diversity, geographical, life experience, et cetera. But then once you get that pool together, you pick the best person for the job. And by constantly harping on, you know, we're going to have a uh, a cabinet that looks like America. I'm sorry, it's actually blacks are going to be overrepresented in the Biden administration. They represent about 12 percent of the population. Now, uh, you know, I guess you could say, well, they represent a, a larger portion of that of, of Biden's voters. But I just I hate the bean counting. I think it's really destructive and, the, and it doesn't um, help the people who get picked who are otherwise quite well qualified um, by having them look like they're tokens. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I, I think the way to do it is to pick a, a diverse group of people, but not say that you're going to pick right, a diverse group right. of people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, that's, a, that's a, don't harp on it all the time. Yeah, just, you know, just yeah. announce, you know, well, uh, interesting. Like, uh, as he did with the, with the vice presidential pick, it would have been correct. far better for Biden to simply say, I'm picking Kamala Harris right. because she's the best and not because I want to pick a woman. And by the way, you know, who did this well was George W. Bush. And I happen to know because I was one of his picks, as you recall, I was his <laughs> yes. first nominee for secretary of labor. Uh, It didn't pass my notice that uh, when I was trotted out, uh, there were two men and me. Um, The uh, representation, not just in terms of of sex, but also uh, ethnicity and race, always seemed to sort of balance each other out on the days he would usually (laughs) announce his nominees three at a time. Uh, And it was never three white men. You know, right, so, right. So, but he didn't make a big deal about it. Uh, it just right. sort of happened, and I think that's a better way to go. So, um, Damon, one of the uh, one of the criticisms that comes up. Well, it's not a criticism, but but one of the the needles that has to be threaded. Let's put it that way, is that um, you know Biden has said he wants to adopt a new tone, and it, you know, I think he's very sincere about that. Um, but there are certain people like Neera Tandon that he has selected for OMB where, you know, she's been very spicy and tart in her Twitter commentary in particular about Republicans. And so, you know, the danger is that Democrats are going to say, uh, oh, well, you can't criticize her for being that way when, you know, look at look at Trump's Twitter feed, right? So yeah, I mean it, it is true that we're in the situation where the the uh, the two parties are constantly calling out each other for being hypocrites and sort of failing to adhere to the standards that they apply to the other side, and then treating that as an excuse to uh, to diverge even further from those standards. And with someone like Neera Tandon, I mean I don't know. I'm on Twitter a lot. She can be pretty obnoxious on there, and you know that's not great. I would much rather these kinds of discussions have less to do with how people behave on Twitter and more to do with 
their policy making ideas, like where they're coming from ideologically, what their priorities are, the reason why Biden wants that person in the administration, what he thinks they can contribute to his agenda. Now, would I vote for Neera Tandon to be president after what I've seen her do on uh, Twitter? Probably I wouldn't. But of mm-hmm. course, she's working for Biden. And in fact, to even uh, go back to the Austin pick at, at defense, I mean, I agree totally with, with what Michael Totten said about the, the concerns about um, about having someone who, who is not far enough away from having been a military officer uh, in the position, especially since it's the law that sort of prudently and legally not a great idea, but I don't get that up in arms about it because what counts is Joe Biden. No secretary of defense is going to be kind of going off half cocked and starting wars, wars or ending wars or moving troops around without the president signing off and, and pointing to, in, in the direction of wanting to do those things. So what matters is Joe Biden and he is a civilian and therefore the military will be in control of civilians. Yeah, so but I, isn't he putting, sorry to interrupt, but isn't Biden putting s- Democratic senators in a little bit of a bind? The ones who said that they would not vote for the waiver for Mattis and, and have declared that they, they just don't think that that should be a tradition of, of waiving this requirement? Sure, sure. I, I think for a whole host of prudential reasons, it's probably not a good choice. Uh, so mm-hmm. yes, I agree. It probably uh, is ill-advised. I'm just saying that um, kind of judged in a more kind of absolute standard, uh, I just, I don't see that it's that big of a deal. Um, in the scheme of other problems, I would be much more upset at the idea of a major policymaking position being held by someone who uh, who held kind of rather extreme views on policy uh, than I, I am about some of these other things. So, uh, you know, Tandon, I don't have greatly strong feelings about either. I think that for prudential reasons, she's also not a great pick because that it could end up uh, leading her to get blocked by Republicans, and it would be for such a kind of uh, sort of trivial, trivial thing. reason yeah. that mm-hmm. I'm not sure it's worth the, the new administration wasting time and expending any political capital in order to fight for it. Um, but you know, in general, I've been I've been fairly happy with uh, Biden's picks so far, uh, and, and and I also saw it was just strategically leaked. I saw while we've been recording that Biden said, uh, I think in a fundraiser somewhere that, yeah, the Republicans used to fund the police to really kick our butts or something like that. And I, yes, and so that you know that's another sign that I think. Biden is both very much aware of what I consider to be the true political dynamic out there in the country and is is uh, using that to inform his picks on these things. So that cheers me. Yeah. And it also uh, sheds light on or at least puts the light at people's notions that, oh, you know, Biden is actually just a stalking horse for the left. <laughs> yeah, that, was, that was never true. Yeah, it was never true. Um, OK, but. Um, uh, Bill, let, let's talk, though, about um, this problem of choosing people from the House and Senate, uh, because there's been a lot of chatter about potential picks who are sitting senators and Congress people, and the margins are so narrow that it strikes me as a little bit ill-advised to even think about taking somebody out of your caucus in the House or Senate, and especially the, well, like, for example, you know, I read this piece just this morning about, you know, progressives were hoping for Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren to be given a cabinet post, and that hasn't happened. But, you know, both Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders are senators from states with Republican governors. So if, if they were appointed, they would lose the Senate for sure. Uh, that's, 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 one of many reasons why neither, in my judgment, got close to getting picked. Mm-hmm. There were others. Let me, you know, uh, let me just frame my remarks, uh, Mona, by saying that I started off quite enthusiastic about the administration uh, that uh, the president-elect was constructing. Uh, I've become a little bit less enthusiastic over the past week. 
Uh, and let me explain why, both in general and in particular. First of all, uh, a very high priority is being given to personal relationships with the president elect. That's not all bad, but to the extent that it becomes a dominant criterion, uh, I think it, it can become excessive. Uh, and my, in my estimation, it has become excessive as the process has, has gone forward. Uh, my second reservation is that almost all the people being picked are experienced and competent, uh, but not known as being very creative thinkers or innovators. Uh, and that is fine if you think that we're in a period in which business as usual is going to, is going to be good enough. I'm not convinced that's the correct assessment. Uh, the only partial exception to this generalization is Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor. And I hope very much uh, that, you know, that his thought processes will be very much in evidence in the uh, crystallization of the Biden foreign policy. Uh, now, getting down to specifics, uh, the four most recent picks have troubled me for different reason, reasons. Uh, you know, Becerra, and I agree with, with Linda entirely, is very experienced and competent, uh, but the main topics on the table for HHS are not his main areas of competence. And I do think that I, I do think that there were reasons, given the urgency of the problems on HHS's plate, uh, to take that uh, to take that more seriously than the president elect did. Uh, we learned this morning that Susan Rice is going to be picked to head up the Domestic Policy Council. Mm. Uh, you know, it would have been equally sensible to make me the National Security Advisor. I simply, I, I do not, I do, well, I understand that, but I don't understand that. Uh, General Austin, uh, the biggest threat that we have now is in, you know, East Asia and the Pacific. And it's not the kind of threat that a veteran army guy is likely to be very experienced in dealing with or even thinking about. He spent 40 years honorably and effectively doing something else entirely. Why him? Uh, and finally, uh, we have learned very recently uh, that the pick to head the VA will be Dennis McDonough, uh, the, you know, the, former, the former chief of staff. Uh, among other things, to President Obama. Uh, I'm not sure I get that one either. I mean, the, the official, the official uh, justification is that, well, he knows how to make the levers of government work. I hope that's true. Uh, but as far as forging strong relationships with veterans groups, he starts at a disadvantage. So... You know, I'm a little bit puzzled by the trajectory of appointments over the past week, uh, but one thing has become very clear. The left has the, of the Democratic Party has the capacity to veto some people it doesn't like. It has no capacity to get the people it does like nominated. You know, at most, they can acquiesce in nominations that other factions in the party are also willing to go along with. I think that's a very interesting commentary on where things now stand. Mm. Linda, you wanted in on this? Yeah, you know, I'm really relieved to hear Bill say what he did because I have been looking at this and despite, you know, liking people like Becerra and thinking some of the picks seem just fine, I did have the feeling that this was sort of the B-plus team, uh, not the A-team. And the thing that, that Bill suggested that I think is is in many ways more concerning is this notion that Biden is picking people with whom he has had personal relations. 
we have just gone through four years of a president who picked people solely on the basis of his, you know, have, being comfortable with them. Now, I'm not suggesting that any of these nominees are at the low level of, uh, or quality of, of many of Trump's pick, but I do think that there's a problem. You know, when you're when you're in an, uh, leading up an, an agency or a department, you have to have um, the ability to lead and to say no um, to the White House. Um, and so I, I just, um, I, I am a little concerned about that. There, there are too many people with whom, you know, he's had some past relationship and he's therefore comfortable with. Um, but he's, you know, having people who are independent thinkers, I think Bill's point about people being creative thinkers, uh, it, it does, there just aren't any real stars here where you see someone, you know, coming out of the block um, with really innovative ideas. I mean, the, this this um, federal government needs to be rebuilt. And I just don't see these picks as being quite uh, the stellar picks I had hoped for. Damon. All I wanted to add is that um, when I last spoke, I said some nice things about Biden's picks, and I want to instead shift my uh, – opinion over to bill galston's and say he's <laughs> persuaded me like i'm now very disappointed <laughs> okay not, maybe so, not quite that much but i i do think he made a lot of good points there and uh you know I, uh, uh, well done <laughs> okay all right so uh beg to agree um yes. I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I i just have a point of personal privilege not personal privilege uh, moderator's privilege i would like to just express my uh, reservations about becerra um because i believe that he is um uh, that, that he has shown sort of a bad faith um uh, attitude in the past. When he was attorney general of the state of California, but post he still holds, um, he uh, he went after this journalist, uh, uh, David Deladen, who made these videos about Planned Parenthood. He went, you know, uh, he went incognito and he and he did these these uh, these uh, undercover videos of Planned Parenthood in an effort to hurt the organization, no question about it. And he may have violated some laws about, you know, where you need consent for that kind of thing or whatever. But, but um, Becerra went after this guy w with like 12 different felony, you know, uh, counts and, you know, basically threw the book at him where people who had done other undercover videos, you know, of like revealing problems in duck fact, you know, duck plants or chicken manufacturers and whatever, you know, they had not been punished that way at all. And, and, um, it just struck me as highly political. I thought it was really kind of a malicious prosecution and an abuse of his, um, of his authority. And I was not, not at all impressed, uh, with that. Um, so, and of course, there was no no investigation of Planned Parenthood that arose from any of that. Um, so, anyway, that's my my comment. Um, does anybody want to weigh in at all on the revelation that Hunter Biden is indeed under criminal investigation? If not, we'll leave it there. <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll, I'll wait in, uh, Mona. Okay. Um, you, you know, what, what was, of course, is so interesting about this is apparently he has been under investigation for quite a while now, and uh, it was kept secret uh, until just recently. I don't think we know uh, what is going to happen there, and I don't think we know fully whether this was an entirely justified uh, investigation. Um, certainly some of the answers that uh, Hunter Biden gave uh, publicly, I think it was Vanity Fair or one of the other glossy magazines that he was asked about a diamond he was given um, after a meeting in China, and he didn't seem to know what had happened to that di diamond. It was 2.8 carats. Um, I think you remember what <laughs> what you do with a 2.8 <laughs> carat diamond, or at least I would. Happens to me all the time. Um, all the time. Yeah, I have, I know, I have problems keeping track of my diamonds, but um, that, you know that that is a little bit worrying, um, and I think it's going to be something. That that uh, 
president-elect Biden is going to have to be very, very careful with. Um, we're going to have to hope that this is a legitimate investigation, that this was not based on Donald Trump wanting to lock him up um, and uh, that, you know, there was reason to do this. And, and I would hope for the sake of, you know, the country and everything else that the investigation turns out to find that there was no criminal wrongdoing by a member of the Biden family. But, um, you know, it's a, it's, it's a tough one. I, you know, it's kind of heartbreaking. Um, and I think though, that the, the, the overwhelming, um, uh, public need here is for Biden to not intervene in any way or be seen to intervene in any way with the workings of the Justice Department. Uh, we need that. Uh, that has to be highest priority. Uh, and even though it's very, very painful, uh, I think he, he really needs to have a hands-off uh, approach. Um, okay, let's briefly uh, get to um, the ongoing uh, absurd what, keystone coup attempt by um, by President Trump and by many Republicans uh, to steal the election. Um, we had armed demonstrators appearing in front of the home of the Michigan Secretary of State in charge of, obviously, of the election in Michigan, um, chanting, stop the steal and your murderers. Um, and uh, Bill Galston, uh, we have Senator Ted Cruz stepping forward to say that he'd be happy to argue the bill, the uh, Ken Paxton lawsuit that's coming out of Texas and has been joined by 17 other state attorneys general to argue this case before the Supreme Court. Um, I know you think that uh, this is all going to be behind us soon, but the reason I want to talk about it is that the a big portion, maybe the majority of the Republican party is in on this is not, you know, the, the overwhelming majority of elected Republicans, something like 88% refuse to say who won the election. Uh, yes, I believe I'm aware of that, Mona. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, look, there are two possibilities. Either the Republican elected officials know the truth, or they don't. And I'm not sure which one is worse, frankly. Uh, I'm sure that there are some true believers, you know, insofar as I can read the minds of people like Louis Gohmert from Texas. You know, <laughs> There's nothing there to be read, Bill. <laughs> right? What mind? Uh, <laughs> look, uh, I think there are probably some Republican elected officials who, who, who actually believe this nonsense. Uh, but my guess is that the vast majority in their heart of hearts, and I've made an optimistic presumption by using that phrase, mm -hmm. uh, know the truth and for reasons of cynicism or cowardice or both, simply refuse to affirm it. They're asking themselves, for the most part, what do I have to gain by affirming the truth as opposed to biting my tongue? And if you run the calculus that way, the answer is they have nothing to gain and lots to lose. So why not just get along and go along? Uh, the Washington Post survey revealed, I think, 27 House Republican House members who were willing to say on the record that, uh, you know, that Joe Biden was the president elect of the United States, a much fewer number who said that Donald Trump was, and the vast majority simply refused to answer the question. That mm -hmm. speaks volumes, right? Yep. That, you know, that tells you that the cynicism slash cowardice uh, analysis is, it represents the bulk of the, bulk of the cases. Uh, and I freely grant that this nonsense has implications for the future uh, insofar as it bespeaks a mindset, uh, which, you know, which will certainly be communicated to a credulous base, already has been, uh, where, where it will stick around a lot longer uh, than, you know, than the stance of the elected officials who will 
uh, go back to, you know, allegedly performing their duties on January 20th. Um, Michael Totten, um, the, um, the, this, this problem though is a lot more damaging to our democratic system than any of the previous norm shattering grotesqueries of the Trump years, because it goes to the fundamental confidence that the public has in elections. And if the, if the polling is right, and if it holds, you know, that 75%, so according to a Monmouth University poll found 75% of Republicans were not too confident or not at all confident that the 2020 election was conducted fairly and accurately. And you now have this, this phenomenon where, you know, the leaders of the conservative movement and the Republican Party are talking secession and uh, so forth. It's quite a, um, quite a remarkable thing for the party of the so-called party of patriotism uh, to, to be talking secession as Rush Limbaugh has been doing on the radio. Yeah, this is all very bad and bleak, but I'm going to just let me try to be optimistic about this. I'm going to just I'm going to do the best I can. here. OK, um, OK, no question. No question. It's very dangerous. And we're going to have no excuse for being surprised if this gets people killed. But let's let's set aside for that. Let's set that aside for a moment as much as we can set such a thing aside. Trump's attempt to steal the election has a zero percent chance of success. We probably shouldn't say anything has a zero percent chance but it's 0%. Now, the number of Republican officials who are enabling this is shocking and appalling, but this wouldn't be happening if anyone other than Donald Trump were president. Jeb Bush would never do something like this. Nikki Haley would never do something like this. Mike Pence wouldn't be involved in this if he were president instead of vice president. Only Trump would do this. And it's failing so spectacularly that I doubt anyone else will try it again. Because why would they? What would be the incentive? Because it worked last time? Now, maybe someone will try something like this if the vote is razor close in a single swing state. But that might have happened. That might have happened in a case like that, even if Trump never existed. So I'm just not sure this is going to be the new normal after Trump is truly gone from the scene, which at this point probably requires him to be dead. But God knows I've underestimated Trump's awfulness before. Hmm. Um, Damon, um, this this thing is going to drag out past the new year, it looks like, because it turns out, who knew, that if one member of Congress and one senator request it, oh, so on January 6th, but the day after the Georgia runoff, coincidentally, but on January 6th, that's the day that is usually a ceremonial occasion where the announcement is made of the winner of the previous election, that is the Electoral College vote is announced. It's usually done, it's always done, I believe, by the sitting vice president at the time. So in his day, uh, Richard Nixon had to announce the winner being John F. Kennedy, and Al Gore had to announce that that George W. Bush was the victor. And both of both gentlemen, by the way, did that with good grace. Um, but um, but now it turns out that if one senator and one congressman protest. They can demand a vote of the full Congress on accepting or not accepting the results of the Electoral College, and they can get into a big debate. I suspect we're going to see something like that. Yes. Um, now, I mean, I, I will my my beg to differ moment uh, today, it sounds like, is going to be with uh, with Michael Totten, where I'm going to say it is not a zero percent chance that <laughs> Trump will succeed in his coup attempt. It is probably more like two percent, but <laughs> but that's the difference between two and effectively infinitely nothing uh, if you go to zero. So um, I do I think it's extremely unlikely that he will succeed, but I think that. Um, the the way that this has unfolded step by step on, on one level you've seen the process happening exactly as you would expect it to uh you know we did have a delay of a few weeks before the official uh transition began but then it did and it is it is underway i've even seen stories about how 
like literally Trump and the first lady are planning to literally move out of the White House. They're making plans for this. So yes, this is almost certainly going to happen, but it is almost certain and not certain. And the reason why is because as the time goes on, we keep learning things like this, like the Mona, what you just said, that like, oh, you mean there are other steps where people can raise objections that no one ever considered objecting to in the past. Yeah. And and they keep coming up. And if if it can if it is in fact the case that like something approaching the numbers we saw in that poll of of Republican Congress, men and women, actually, if it if it breaks down something like that with only maybe 40 or 50 Republicans voting, saying that, in fact, Biden is the president, um, that would be atrocious for the country. But my my real concern is not the two percent likelihood that I think that it that actually Trump succeeds in in uh, taking over uh, by a kind of force in overturning the results of the election. It's it's this other business about the fact that the Republican Party is now actively cultivating a kind of citizen, and it is not a citizen of a democracy. It is not a given in human history that human beings just automatically do the right thing, even when it's costly. And you have to cultivate people who are willing, who you have to reward acts of honorable sacrifice for the good of the political community. And right now, Republicans are not doing that. They're doing the opposite. They're deliberately saying and doing idiotic, incredibly irresponsible things in order to get the cheers of, I'll be honest, an ignorant mob. And in doing that, they're making the mob more ignorant and more hateful. And this is happening and repeating itself in a kind of death spiral every single day. These are people we have to keep living with. There are fellow citizens who are going to keep voting, who are going to protest, who are going to be putting pressure on their elected officials going forward. And that's where it's scary. I don't know if, as Michael said, that uh, the exact scenario will be unfolding again in the future like it has this time without actually Trump on the scene. But other bad things can happen when such a significant chump of the chunk of the electorate uh, is buying into this kind of civic poison that is now circulating around the country. I want to underline that with my black Sharpie, you know, three <laughs> times and say, absolutely right. Um, this For this process to succeed, for democracy to succeed, you need a certain kind of citizen who does accept loss gracious, somewhat graciously, if reluctantly, and understands that we have peaceful transition of power and that's the key to our thriving and if you if you lose that kind of citizen and it's replaced by this authoritarian mob, uh, that's truly truly scary. Let also let me just say a word about the Republicans and their complete disregard for decency and honor. Ken Paxton, the Attorney General of the State of Texas, who is bringing this lawsuit that has been joined by seventeen other attorneys general. Um, what do we know about him? He's under indictment. Okay, and eight of his top deputies resigned in protest because of his uh, unethical behavior as attorney general of the state of Texas. This is their front man. Uh, there is absolutely no sense in the Republican ranks anymore that you can do something that's so shameful that you should go hide. The Trump has obliterated that. Okay, Bill Galston, you wanted in. Well, Simply to say on a contrarian note, uh, bring it on. You know, if you know, if there is a House and Senate objector on January 6th, uh, then both houses are going to have to vote. And so far, you know, so far, complicity has been expressed through silence. Now people are going to have to stand up and be counted. Uh, there may be, and I'll be very interested to see how many members of the House and Senate, Republican members, are willing to attach their names to this fraud. And 
What's Mitch McConnell going to do? Hmm. Inquiring minds want to know. <laughs> Linda? Well, I wish I could believe that uh, these people will vote against it. There'll be a lot of people who will vote for it. But we have another you know, uh, issue even before we get to January 6th. And maybe we'll know by the end of the day today, maybe we won't. Th- this ridiculous lawsuit, if anybody's read the complaint, it, the plaintiff's uh, brief, it is absolutely uh, without merit. Preposterous. Preposterous. And President uh, Trump's, uh, you know, effort to intervene on his own behalf, preposterous. But we have a Supreme Court, but Supreme Court justices are people. Um, You know, I don't know Clarence Thomas all that well. I used to know him a lot better during the Reagan years, but I, and I knew his wife well, Ginny Thomas. What do you think they watch for their evening news um, at night? Do you think they're watching uh, the three networks or CNN or MSNBC? They're watching Fox. And uh, I don't. Well, think- Ginny for sure. Ginny for, for sure. sure about well, <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, you know, spouses have influence. Sam- yeah. Samuel Alito has, has said some things that could concern me. So uh, what I am worried about is, yes, they may turn this down. They should do exactly what they did, uh, you know, last week with the Pennsylvania case. Uh, they should just have a one line, you know, opinion that says we're not taking it. But it is possible that there'll be dissents from that. Um, or, I mean, it is not impossible, I think, that they might think, well, we have to hear these, and and maybe even with the best intentions, maybe thinking that we need to air these um, disputes in a way that we can put them to rest. But, you know, we we can still have um, something coming out of the Supreme Court that is divided. If if it's not a 9-0, I think that's going to be very, very bad, not just for the country, but it's certainly going to be bad for the institution. So count me as still holding my breath. Yeah, well, that's that's an excellent point. All right. We have come to the final segment now where we highlight something. Um, Let's start with Michael Totten. Okay, so I don't disagree with any of the doom and gloom here today, but we don't know what's going to happen. There is a range of possibilities, and they aren't all bad. So a return to normal in 2021 is obviously out of the question. But two encouraging data points emerged over the last couple of days. A Marist poll found that 60% of Americans don't want Trump to run again in 2020, and that includes 33% of Republicans. Now, I'd feel better if 66% of Republicans felt this way, but Trump isn't even out of the building yet. Meanwhile, Joe Biden's approval rating is already above 50%, comfortably above 50%, and Trump never hit that number, not once, for even five consecutive minutes. But Biden hit it before he was even sworn in. Now, Biden's approval rating is likely to drop at some point because that's life, but I can't imagine Trump looking better in hindsight, especially after the pandemic ends, the economy recovers, and the news becomes halfway boring again. 2020 is not gonna look like the good old days to most people. I just can't see it. Even a partial return to normalcy is going to feel like paradise when we get there. And I won't be surprised if most people refuse to disrupt it all over again. Interesting, okay. So we're gonna have another roaring 20s, like the 2020s instead of the 1920s perhaps. (laughs) Um, Okay, Linda. Yeah, we might. Linda. Okay. Well, um, I want to point to an article that was in the New York Times in the opinion section by a professor of law at Columbia University, Tim Wu. Don't know him uh, from Adam, but he wrote a terrific column, I thought, which was what really saved the Republic from Trump. And he said it wasn't our constitutional system of checks and balances. Instead, he pointed to uh, a, def- a different set of limits. It wasn't uh, the separation of powers. Congress was uh, neutered by the Trump administration. He said that what saved us was an informal and unofficial set of institutional norms upheld by federal prosecutors, military officers, and state election officials. He said you might call these values our unwritten constitution, and he thinks they were decisive, and I couldn't agree more. I thought it was a very thoughtful column. Thanks. Damon. Uh, This is a little bit uh, from the past. Uh, This 
piece originally was posted online on November 24th, but it appeared in the New York Times in the print edition a bit after that, right at the end of November. Uh, it's a very long essay by Jennifer Senior, one of the smartest people working at the Times, titled Happiness Won't Save You. And it's it's a really moving, uh, fairly deep uh, exploration of the story of a psychologist named Philip Brickman, who uh, studied happiness and, and authored some very influential studies on what makes and does not make a person happy. And then uh, he leapt to his death uh, from a building at the University of Michigan in 1982. And... Uh, a senior uses this as an occasion to go back, look at this guy's research, interview his family members, his friends, and just recreate the whole setting of his youth, his career, his writing of his research, and then his suicide, and to reflect in, I think, a fairly deep way, especially for a newspaper essay, um, on the mystery of, of happiness and misery. It's a, it's a mm -hmm. very, very deep piece and worth reading, even though it's about uh, a couple of weeks in the past. <laughs> it, it has <laughs> shelf life of a couple of weeks. It, which is it does. Something, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. It doesn't, doesn't sound like it is necessary to be timely for something no, like that. No. All right. Um, Bill. Yes. I want to present a balanced slate of good news and bad news. Uh, in the good news column, uh, you know, as, as we began this podcast, uh, the White House announced that Morocco would be the latest Arab nation to establish diplomatic relations with the state of Israel. Uh, and I, I think in an interesting way, you know, that dovetails uh, with you know, Michael's very interesting, you know, set of distinctions, you know, between countries in the Middle East and North Africa that were doing pretty well for one reason or another, and those that those that aren't. And those that are seem to be much more likely to establish diplomatic relations with Israel than those who aren't. Now, in the bad news column, my favorite whipping boy, the gift who keeps on giving, Michael Pack. Uh, his latest outrage was to dismiss the acting director of The Voice of America and replace him with an anti-gay activist, uh, the author of such books as Making Gay Okay, How Rationalizing Homosexual Behavior is Changing, everything. Uh, the, you know, the ranking member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, Mike McCall, Republican of Texas, was deep, deeply disturbed by this latest development uh, and, uh, and told Mr. Pack in no uncertain terms that, that he ought to be protecting the brave journalists of the Voice of America, not persecuting them. Uh, you know, this just keeps on getting worse and worse, you know, it is it is shameful uh, what's going on uh, with our international broadcasting system. Right. Well, Michael was a, a friend of mine for many many years, and I'm just grieved uh, by by this news. That's a, that's all I can say about it. Well, um, the fact that the fact that he's been collaborating with Steve Bannon on projects tells you everything you need to know about his current incar in incarnation. Yeah. All right. I would like to mention a piece uh, by uh, Charles Lane that appeared in the Washington Post, and it is <laughs> as the not very exciting headline of economics is going through an intellectual revolution on public debt. Now, hold on. I know everybody's getting all excited and I uh, can't wait to hear more, but really it is important. Um, this is a, this is a column about, um, how economists are about reevaluating some assumptions that have been sort of rock solid in the field for, for decades, if not longer, 
about the effect of large public debt on on interest rates and inflation. And and you know, it's a case of reality sort of colliding with theory. So it's interesting. I don't know what the real answer is, but I do think it's something more worth looking into and and uh, studying, talking about. And on that note, we've invited Chuck Lane to join us and he'll be coming on the podcast. So maybe we'll get into this a little bit more. And um, so thank you one and all, Michael. It was great to have you. Thank you so much. Um, we thank all our listeners and uh, we will come back next week, like every week. Uh, thank you so much. 